Uh, we have a very, very special guest today who has come a long way to talk about a fascinating project, Kevin Morell, uh, who I have learned, uh, getting to know him personally in the last 24 hours or so, has a lot in common with many of you because he developed a passion for computing at a relatively young age, uh, in part by working on PDP-11s and VAX-based systems, uh, is very knowledgeable about the industry and fell in love with the idea of computing at almost every level. Uh, he's now the secretary of the Computer Conservation Society in the United Kingdom and a trustee of the National Museum of Computing in the UK. The Computer Conservation Society is really a kind of fascinating place to me. It's a joint venture of the British Computer Society, the Science Museum of London, and the Museum of Science and Industry in Manchester. Its chairman is Dr. David Hartley, who has had a long and distinguished career at Cambridge University and who will be our guest tonight uh, discussing the life of Sir Maurice Wilkes, and I hope you'll be here for that. But today's agenda, this afternoon's agenda, is Kevin's uh, presentation on a, on a rather monumental project, which is the building of an operational replica of EDSAC, the Electronic Delay Storage Automatic Calculator. EDSAC was built by a team, as I'm sure many of you know, led by uh, Sir Morris Wilkes uh, immediately after the Second World War, and among its many innovations was the programming that it gave life to. Many of the methods that are still used today were born on the EDSAC. Uh, the Computer Conservation Society is taking the lead in building this replica and intends to construct as authentic a machine as it can using available materials and within current regulations today and it hopes to have a, a really exceptional educational experience uh, in the UK when it's complete. All of this work is taking place at uh, one of the most storied centers of computing in all the world uh, at Bletchley Park. This effort is largely volunteer-led. It's very generously funded by both private and public sources in the UK, and as ambitious as it is, it's just one of many uh, restoration or rebuilding projects that the Society is doing as part of its charter. So first I'm going to ask Kevin to come and give you a presentation on the project, and then after that, our chairman, Lynn Shustick, uh, who I hope has finished his sandwich by then, will come up, and uh, he and Kevin will uh, have a dialogue here on stage. You have question and answer cards in front of you, please. Feel free to use those. Uh, we'll be collecting those and passing those up to Lynn as the Q&A begins. So please welcome uh, Kevin Morrell to the stage and join me in uh, welcome, welcoming him to the Computer History Museum. Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for, um, for John's very kind introduction, and thank you all for, for spending the time coming over today. Um, as John said, I'd like to talk about the activities of the Computer Conservation Society in the UK, and uh, with particular reference later on to the, the planned replica of the EDSAC machine. But if I start a uh, little bit about the Computer Conservation Society, it was formed in September 89 um, by three founding bodies, our parents, which was the London Science Museum, the Museum of Science and Industry in Manchester, and the British Computer Society. And we were very lucky. It was the right people at the right time. Both Doran Swade was curator of computing at the London Science Museum, and an assistant curator there was Tony Sale. Tony Sale, many of you might have heard of, then went on to rebuild the Colossus machine. And it was very much a desire to have machines working. They all felt that, as museum artifacts, computers were a special case. And nothing could be learned necessarily from a machine that wasn't operating. And it was important to have machines restored and working for the public. Now, in 89, that was fairly radical. And, and there are various conflicting views at the Science Museum. Now, the curators at the Science Museum are very keen to learn as much as possible. There are academics at the Science Museum. They're keen to understand the machine and build the complete history. The conservators at the museum are concerned with looking after the machine, looking after the machine for many, many generations, and are almost completely anti-powering the machine up. So, Reconciling those views was difficult, and one of the things that the Computer Conservation Society did is put together a, a series of protocols that would govern how we worked and how we restored machines. 
Now, the engineer's view is really quite contrary to the conservator's view. The engineers are very keen to have machines restored, running their original systems, and actually working and explained and showed to the public. Um, and the visitors, of course, there's almost nothing worse than looking at a, a machine that's not switched on. But having a machine switched on with the sounds and the smells of the machine, watching paper tape shoot through the machine and line printers operating, that, goes, that works very, very well for visitors at all of our museums. Now, the original projects that were set up for the CCS it's, it's actually quite an interesting mixture between UK and US machines. The Ferranti Pegasus is a, now I'm going to say valve base, but I'm going to probably try and switch between vacuum tube and valve base, so I'm afraid you have to probably bear with me. But it's a valve based machine from the 1950s. Um, that's on display and at the London Science Museum and has been restored to working order. The other machine that was um, the original series of projects was the Elliott 803. Now that's a transistorized, germanium transistorized machine, general purpose machine from developed in Britain in the early 60s. Then, oddly, um, we had quite a group of people that were very interested in S100 based systems, particularly the Kromenko Series 3 North Star Horizon machines. So they were also part of that original project. There's always been a deck group. There's always been a deck group, working group with the CCS as well. And the original projects that they were restoring was a straight eight, original desktop PDP-8. And it's sort of a simpler brother, the serial version of the machine. The final project was something called the Totalizator machine. This is a huge electromechanical machine for calculating um, betting odds and parimutuel betting. Now, this was, this was rescued from uh, a racetrack in the UK and put into storage in the London Science Museum. There was a plan at that stage to actually restore that machine to order. That never actually came to fruition, although we're actually talking now about perhaps actually progressing that. England's a fairly compact little country, but I thought I'd just explain some of the places we're talking about. Later on, I shall be talking about the Birmingham Science Museum. That square in the middle is pretty well where Birmingham is. It's where I grew up. Um, Harwell and London down is about 100 miles or so further south. Manchester, 100 miles further north. And Cambridge, about 80 miles to the east. Much of the activity of the CCS now takes place at the Manchester Science Museum, the London Science Museum, and as John said earlier, at the National Museum of Computing at Bletchley. Before I talk about the EDSAC project, uh, I'd like to talk about the machine that's actually currently being restored. And it's a machine with a particularly charmed life. It's known, its title, official title, is the Harwell Decatron Computer. And to, to deconstruct that slightly, Harwell is uh, a village in Oxford, um, in the UK, that was the centre of atomic research post World War II. And their requirement was to build a computer to actually take over the roles of hand cranked calculators. Now, this machine was produced in uh, 1951. Now, I'm the sort of geeky teenager that spent every Saturday afternoon at the Science Museum, Birmingham Science Museum, through the 70s. I got to the point where I simply knew everything that was on inventory and would recognize any changes. And during the 70s, this machine appeared. And it was never powered up, and it wasn't really completely explained, but uh, was shown at, the Science at the Birmingham Science Museum. And I became fascinated with the machine, uh, learned as, as much as I could at that time, which wasn't very much. Later, in the year 2000, I actually started proper research in the machine, uh, and proper research in you know, spending time at the British Library, and actually really built quite a history of the machine. machine. It was developed uh, at Harwell, not as a, as a particularly fast machine, but to replace the hand-cranked calculators they were using there. It went live in 1951, 
and by 57, uh, Harwell had bought production machines and the machine was redundant. But rather than it being scrapped, part of its charm life was they actually organised a competition to find a new use for the machine. And it was won by a college, and the college took the machine over and used it as part of their undergraduate training. Part of the research was finding this particular photograph. Now, this photograph was published in a local paper near the college that had the machine, published in 1961. It's quite definitely the machine that was at the, I'd seen at the Science Museum. I had been talked about in some of the early history of British computing. The, chap, the, the, the caption on this photograph described the chap on the left as Peter Burden, age 17, who had just was waiting to go up to Cambridge to study mathematics. Well, that's a very good clue because if they were going to, if, if this chap Peter was going to Cambridge, I could get in touch with the Cambridge Alumni Society and track Peter down. In fact, that's exactly what we did. It turned out that Peter had indeed gone off to Cambridge um, with a degree in mathematics, gone back into teaching afterwards, and in fact had gone back to the college that this photograph was taken and was involved in actually using the machine. That's when the uh, story came to a halt. I couldn't find any more information. I knew the machine had been uh, decommissioned from the college. That's the point it had gone to Birmingham Science Museum, when I had seen it as a teenager, and then it was completely lost. However, in 2003, a colleague of mine was taking some pictures at a museum collection centre of a completely different machine. And this photograph is, it isn't very clear at all. It's been enhanced. It was a tiny fragment in the background of the machine that was being photographed. And you can just about see in the middle there a control panel. And if I bring in a piece of the previous image, it's actually that same control panel. So sitting there completely disconnected, um, racked up um, out of the way was this original machine. Now, at that point, I, I, I had assumed the machine was completely lost. Um, I didn't, when I recognised the machine in the photographs and put two and two together, sadly there was nobody else to explain this to at the time, so I simply just did a dance around the office. But the, the excitement of finding this machine was quite fantastic. Um, in the years following 2003, we actually then, in the, in the collection centre and various other, other museum stores, found all of the components of the machine. All disassembled, separated, not labelled or indexed properly, but by literally searching from crate to crate and from um, centre to centre, we found all the components of the machine. So in fact, the, the full history of the machine was that it was used in Harwell for atomic energy research from 51. Again, part of its charmed life, it wasn't destroyed at the end of that, and they, found, they organized a competition to find a new use for the machine, and that went to the college in 57, and they used it quite successfully in undergraduate treating until 74. They then retired that to the, to the museum until 80, and then it was lost. And really, 2003 onwards, we found the machine in storage. And by 2010, we'd found absolutely all of the component machine, uh, components of the machine and started the new project. And that's the machine now at the National Museum of Computing at Bletchley Park. The uh, components on the left, on the right hand side, is the power supply, the control panel and control logic in the middle, and the store at the far end. That's currently a CCS project that's restoring that machine to working order. We have much of the machine working already, and by autumn, it should be complete. At that point, we believe it'll be the oldest extant computer in the world, still running. So it's really quite a success finding all of that. Um, as you can imagine, and as you can see from some of the um, covers on the, on the relay racks, it was in quite a sort of sorry state, but complete. Uh, including finding the original uh, schematic diagrams. And actually, since then, we've been able to get in touch with the original designers of the machine.
Now, the EDSAC replica project. Um, I don't want to steal some of uh, David Hartley's talk this evening, but it's a little bit about EDSAC. It was the first practical stored program computer developed. It went live in May 1949, which is some almost a year after the Manchester Baby, the first stored programming machine, was operated. Unlike the Manchester Baby, EDSAC was designed as a service for the university. It wasn't a development machine, it wasn't a test machine for anything. It was designed very conservatively as a service for all the departments of the university. And as I say, it ran its first program, 1949. As John mentioned earlier, it's the electronic delay storage automatic computer. And the storage in the machine has mercury delay lines. These are one inch diameter tubes, about five foot long, with a piezoelectric crystal at either end, filled with mercury. And applying a pulse at one end of the tube would travel down the mercury and appear several milliseconds later. EDSAC had groups of these storage tubes organised in tanks, and that was the primary memory for the machine. Now, as far as the constructions, the reconstruction is concerned, I'll come on to that in, in a moment. There's a question about, of course, about why build a replica? Why build a replica of this machine? I'll show you the, the last, the, the final remaining chassis from the machine in a moment, but there isn't anything left. It was destroyed uh, when Cambridge organised a new machine because of lack of space at the university. So a couple of chassis were actually kept, but primarily it was destroyed. There's well, another question, isn't everything known about the machine already? The designer of the machine, Professor Sir Maurice Wilkes, had said to us a couple of years ago that there was no need to build a replica of EDSAC. Everything was in the archive. All of the information that we could possibly know was in the university archives. Well, over the last year, we've been trawling through all of those archives. And, and at first sight, it does look as if a lot of the information is there. But on closer reading, you find that for a given schematic, there might not be any component values. And when you start reading the text that goes with those, sometimes it's, this is the design of this particular circuit. Other times it will say, this is the planned design of this particular circuit. So we don't have final schematics of the machine at all. So there's a lot that we need to still research and, and work on. Now, we are slowly beginning to fill in some of those gaps. Um, I shall show you in a moment some experiments we've done on the, on the, the final remaining chassis of the machine. There's another question, of course, is just the sourcing of components. Is it actually possible to build a replica of this machine that was built in 49? And we're very concerned with the Computer Conservation Society that we make it as accurate as a, uh, a reconstruction as possible. Luckily, without too much problems at all, we've managed to source over 2,000 of, of the original type of valves from the machine. That hasn't been a problem. Finding passive components, resistors, capacitors, hasn't been a problem either. Interestingly, and perhaps ironically, the most difficult components we've had to find are some of the chassis construction, the actual sockets in the chassis for the vacuum tubes. Now, I think our understanding at this stage is that when, when the production of valve-based systems stopped, then obviously the ancillary equipment, like the valve, the sockets and the tag strips, actually stopped as well, because there'd be no point in producing new ones. Valve production went on for quite a bit longer because of, repl of the replacement of existing installed equipment. So finding valves hasn't been a problem. Finding some of the ancillary circuit items, like tag strips and sockets, has been a problem. We're continuing to search, and it might be that we have to make some sort of fairly pragmatic um, decisions one of which might be to have new sockets and new tag strips actually made anew to match the original design. The other consideration that we're very careful about and very, very concerned about when we start any new computer conservation project 
is what happens when the machine is actually built. The intention is to build the machine on display at the museum and, and have the public involved actually in watching the machine grow um, and, and become operational. What we then actually do with the machine afterwards is particularly important. And that's organising everything from volunteers to demonstrate the machine, to maintain the machine. Uh, it's going in a, uh, in a museum that has a regular education visits and school visits, uh, and university visits. So it's important to us that we have those visitors involved. Um, and we are planning packs of information about the machine that can go to schools and universities prior to their actually coming to the museum with emulators and sample programs. And it's very much our intention, and we've, we've done this before with other projects, is that school parties and university groups will come with programs pre prepared to run on the replica EDSAC machine. Now, we're very much in the research phase at the moment, although we are beginning to source components. Uh, we would expect to start building the machine in about 12 months' time. And our plans are that it should take between three and four years then to actually build the machine and have it on display working. Some of the component choices um, are causing us problems. The main one is the memory system. Obviously, the memory system of the original lead site was this mercury-filled delay line tubes. And whether we or not we use mercury, the assumption is, and our assumption has been so far, that various government regulations and health and safety issues would, would absolutely forbid us using mercury at all. Now, I must say, we haven't actually officially asked anybody. The intention will be to actually make a demonstration mercury delay line tube. But potentially, we might use an alternative delay technology uh, and probably, probably nickel delay lines uh, instead. That's uh, an issue to decide at the moment. I talked a little bit about passive components. They're the sort of valves, the quantities of valves we're looking at. Over two, well, nearly 3,000, actually more than that, isn't it? It's well over 3,000 valves in the machine that we need to source. But that's actually going quite well. T chassis construction, there are 110 very similar chassis in the EDSAC machine made out of mild steel. That we thought was going to be a, a, a serious problem, but in these days with um, CNC machines and laser cutting, it's actually turned out to be relatively simple. Now this is a photograph of EDSAC during its construction. Um, in the middle of the photograph is Sir Maurice Wilkes kneeling down next to one of the tanks containing the mercury delay line tubes. Now, as ever, these photographs tend to be fairly um, posed. Now, what the chaps are doing at the back of just adjusting the valves, I've really no idea at all. But at the front of the picture, there's a single chassis sitting in a rack, surrounded by oscilloscopes. And in fact, if you actually look very carefully, and we've done all of this, the equipment they're looking at is an RF generator there beneath the rack, and an HT power supply which you can just see with that corrugated um, metal edge. Now that, we know from Morris's writings that they were very, very keen to ensure that the memory delay line, the actual storage of the machine, worked reliably before they carried on with the rest of the construction of the machine. Now that's the only chassis there with actually with wires attached. And we believe that's actually was testing the delay line. Now, that's delay, that chassis, it's called the regeneration circuit. And that chassis, that circuit is designed to take the output from a delay line, shape the pulses, and transmit them back into the start of the delay line, and keep that, that, that um, train of pulses continuing. That's the only remaining chassis from EDSAC that's available. That's, there are, well, actually, no, I'm quite wrong. There are two, there are two identical chassis. One that's here at the Computer History Museum, and the one that we photographed here 
which is from the uh, University of Cambridge Computer Lab. Now, Cambridge have very kindly lent us that particular chassis. Now, all the chassis are the same, so we've been able to make accurate sort of CAD drawings of that chassis. It's, a lot of the valves are obviously missing, um, but all the capacitive components were there. So, we started work. There's a lot of detail here, but what we, we were very keen to understand exactly how some of this circuit worked and to compare the actual product, the, the chassis as was built with the published circuit diagrams that we'd got. And this chassis is now under construction. It produced pulses of a 13.6 megahertz pulse carrier into the delay line tube. Now, the little circuit on the left-hand side is uh, obviously a sort of mock-up breadboard, and that's just some CMOS to generate the pulses. We very carefully, with all sorts of monitoring equipment, applied power to that chassis. Using the little CMOS circuit at the left-hand side to generate the incoming pulses, we were expecting to see 13.6 megahertz pulses from the far end of the circuit that would go back to the uh, pizza electric crystal on the delay line. And lo and behold, just without any modification to the board for the, the chassis at all, other than just filling its full complement of valves, it worked absolutely perfectly. Now that, that chassis hadn't been used since 1949. No dry joints, no high value resistors, no open circuit capacitors at all. Works absolutely perfectly. Um, and we found only one discrepancy between the circuit that was proposed by Wilkes and the final production chassis, which obviously is very encouraging for us indeed. Where we are now, we are raising funds for the um, production of the machine uh, in a very uh, not in a public fundraising um, sense at all. We were very lucky uh, that my colleague David Hartley was approached by a gentleman called Herman Hauser, who's now known as a venture capitalist in, in Cambridge. And Herman knew of EDSAC, knew very, knew very well of the EDSAC machine, and inquired whether the CCS had ever concern, uh, considered rebuilding the EDSAC machine. And we said that we hadn't. And Herman said, well, in that case, why not, why not think about it? Why not actually see how much this would actually cost? And of course, we went away and said, sort of six months later, came back to Herman and said, well, we reckon it will cost about a quarter of a million pounds. And Herman looked at our report, nodded his head and said, well, I think we should do this then, don't you? So uh, we're well underway. We're building the team. We expect we're um, about to employ a project leader to lead the team. Let's go back and say, actually, all of this is volunteer-led. So that when we say an employer, um, a, a project leader, it, will, it won't actually be uh, a funded position. But to choose a project leader, we expect the team working on the machine at the museum to be six or eight people. A lot of people have volunteered their time and effort in building repeated chassis, working from home, which will work really quite well. We've done that before. And reserving the space in the museum that we can actually start showing this, um, this, this whole project um, growing. And we expect to have that space in the museum in 12 months' time and then start putting the first chassis in there um, and all of the supporting material we want to do to show people how this project's progressing. There are certain challenges and opportunities for the CCS, which, which may well be common for other activities or other restoration activities in the US. Obviously, the continuing problem of sourcing components for maintenance. Interestingly, sourcing components for modern machines is becoming more and more difficult all the while. The project teams are aging. Um, 
project teams tend to be started by people that worked on the machines when the machines were in um, production. They're, of course, aging. The Health and Safety at Work Act, and I think the closest US equivalent I can think is, is the Occupational Self Safety and Health Administration. They are becoming increasingly concerned about how we restore the machines, how we demonstrate the machines. So it's very important that we work with them over this. They're the people that we will have to talk to regarding potentially using mercury in the machine. But there are actually new opportunities. There are new venues in the UK. There are three primary museums that will look after and display computing equipment. Uh, and there's increasing space to do that with new galleries at the Science Museum and new space at the National Museum of Computing. There's a growing interest from schools and universities that we're bringing university groups in, teaching them programming, teaching them programming in a fairly sort of, uh, say, sort of vicious sort of way. And lots of our students come in and they've used Visual Basic and Visual C++ and Visual C Sharp. We present them with a PDP-8 and say, there's your instruction set and you've got 2K of memory. And that's really gone down very, very well. Again, we send a pack out before they come into the, uh, the museum. They prepare programs, but there's nothing really like the excitement of sitting down in front of the machine with the lights, with the toggle switches, and keying their own code in. We are developing training schemes for engineers to maintain the machines and to, to, to provide that new generation of engineers to take over and look after these machines. Operators to actually operate and, and guides to show the machine and explain the machine to the, to the public. And working with people like the health and safety at work people in developing protocols for working safely with these machines. Some of the machines that we've started to restore, dated from the 50s, include asbestos. Now, there are obviously very strict regulations about how we cope with that and how we manage that. There's also the general sort of safety protocols for working machines that um, have a 300 volt DC power supply capable of delivering 300, um, 15 amps. So that's, that's working with the CCS and the Science Museum. The current CCS project, um, I've divided, it's grown rather a lot since the first original five. These are the projects which are substantially complete and are in a stage now where they're in, under maintenance. And all of these machines are demonstrated live and running. There's the Turing bomb, which is a CCS project, although not strictly a computer, and that's the code-breaking machine designed by, partly by Alan Turing, and that's on demonstration every week at Bletchley Park. The Colossus computer, which is that next generation of uh, electronic cryptographic machines, and again, that's demonstrated every day. Um, the, and the Manchester baby machine, um, at the Manchester Museum, all those three are replicas of the machine. The Ferranti Pegasus, which is a, a valve-based machine on display, usually running, although we have a uh, problem at the moment, with the, uh, at the Science Museum, and two transistorized machines, the Elliott 803 and the 903. Those last two are restorations. They're original machines. The Elliott, for instance, was actually discovered in a barn that hadn't been used for about 20 or 30 years, and that's been restored to working order. So all those machines are available to be used and, and demonstrated. Now, the projects that we have on the go at the moment, that's quite a list. The newest is a plan, a very long-term plan, to rebuild, or to build a replica of Babbage's, Babbage's analytical engine. In fact, actually, replicas quite, um, I, I shouldn't use that term at all, because obviously this was never actually, this was conceived by Babbage, but never actually constructed. Now, that's a, that's a plan that's possibly going to take us the next 25 years. We're working on a uh, differential analyzer. That's the Hartree differential analyzer. Um, and that's been restored at the moment. EDSAC, which we've talked about, a replica. The Harwell Decatron computer. And again, that's a restoration that we expect to have finished really by the end of the year. 
The ICT 1301, now I appreciate many of these names you will not recognize at all. It's a machine developed as a commercial machine in the 50s, um, and that's really going really quite well, actually. That's quite a big uh, mainframe installation down in Kent, and, and they have that machine certainly working. I wouldn't have said reliably, but certainly working. The, vac the, the deck group carry on. Um, PDP-8s that they started with are several of them now, one on gallery at the Science Museum, one at the National Museum of Computing, which are working very well. A couple of PDP-11 based systems, um, air traffic control in the UK was run on a PDP-11 based system, well, hundreds of PDP-11 based systems. The last of those actually came to the museum about five years ago, and that's restored with its dis big display tubes and is actually running at the museum. And the guys are very keen to restore a uh, really quite nice VAX machine, the fault tolerant machine, and that's a new project the deck group has started. Uh, probably our biggest, in terms of floor space machine, is the ICL 2966. This is a mainframe built by ICL in the 80s and was really quite the workhorse for um, mainframe technology in the UK. Now that's, that's quite a challenge, um, but that machine is actually on display. Whatever's actually working at, at any one time is on display to the public. Uh, and again, that's at the National Museum of Computing. Now I quite understand this has been quite a sort of, uh, a sort of quick trip through these machines. Um, but it's, it's, always been quite, it's always been important to us to actually have the public involved, show the machines working, explain as much as we can to the museums, to, to, to the visitors, especially bringing school children in and enthusing school children with these machines. Uh, we, as an example we always use is that all of the visitors, the school children, have all got laptops and they all appreciate how that there's a hard disk inside the laptop. Well, we show them hard disks which are the size of, well, at least as big as this lectern. And one of the fairly cool tricks I think we do is pick one of the, the, the bigger lads in one of the groups, give them a big multi-platter disk pack to hold at arm's length for one of our mainframes, while we get the rest of the group calculating what the capacity of that is compared with their USB pens and so on. Well, of course, by the time they've done that, this poor chap's arm is beginning to tremble. Um, but it's, we have such a response back from these, 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 these pupils, it's very, very encouraging. Um, well, I hope I've given you an idea of activity and computer restoration in the UK. Um, and I think we have an opportunity now as well for some questions. But um, finally, ah, I've got one more slide. I was just about to say thank you as well. Just finally, to give you just an idea of our current plans. As I said, the Science Museum has the Pegasus machine. Museum of Science and Industry in Manchester has the baby, the differential analyzer. A big center of activity for the CCS is the National Museum of Computing at Bletchley Park. It also includes the Turing bomb. And as well as these projects to restore machines, there's continuing publication um, of books and journals by the, by the CCS. We produce the journal called Resurrection four times a year. And we're planning a book on Turing and his contemporaries uh, for the Turing anniversary next year. We suspect there's going to be a lot talked about Turing next year. And we were very keen to make sure that everybody was aware of the engineers that were involved in this. Turing was undoubtedly a brilliant computer scientist, but it's engineers that build machines. Um, so I, think I, should rec I would recommend you look out for that book ne next year. Finally, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Um, um, first of all, I'd like to say what, it's a, what a pleasure it is to have you and David here this week. We treat you as kindred spirits from the old country. Thank you, thank you very much. That's <laughs> very kind. Your, your passion for <laughs> restoring, preserving, rebuilding old computers matches ours. So we are really excited about what you're doing and have a lot of admiration for this EDZAC project because it's daunting. And I'm not sure we would have the courage to do it. And I congratulate you on your courage. 
I'm sure we'll be prepared to share the circuit diagrams when we finally decide, when we finally prove them. But it, it is, it's an exciting project. Actually, one of the things Kevin and I have been talking about is the possibility that they might make two at once and we get the second one here. Uh, the only thing standing between reality and that is a half a million dollars. So if anybody has a source of about a half a million dollars, we could have our very own EDZAC. Uh, if, if you, uh, anyone else wants to ask questions, by the way, fill out your cards and bring them up here, and uh, I'll ask some of mine and uh, some of yours. Um, here's a question, and I don't know if the premise is correct or not, you can tell me. It says that copies of EDZAC were built in other locations and in other countries to take advantage of EDZAC software. Have you looked for them as a source for parts or construction materials? Uh, I, d I don't know that copies of EDSAC were made. Uh, importantly, EDSAC was also the, the, the initial design and, and for the LEO computers. So LEO 1 was very much a sort of copy of EDSAC, although with the addition of um, more sophisticated I.O. to suit that commercial application. Now, LEO is actually very well documented. So we are actually stealing ideas from LEO to fill in some of the gaps that we have with EDSAC. You were explaining the difficulty in the schematics that you do have, that some of them are pre-production, some of them are accurate. Do you have other material, uh, prose descriptions of the machine, timing diagrams, all the other stuff that we, you need to build? We have a limited amount. Um, luckily, EDSAC was reported really quite widely. And for instance, um, Sir Morris produced a paper several years after EDSAC went into production on marginal checking. Um, and the, you know, the adjusting of HT voltages to sort of predict faulty components. That paper incidentally included circuit diagrams and timing diagrams of the production machine, which is absolutely invaluable and isn't, isn't really the initial sort of source that we would expect to find that. And, and that, that goes on obviously all the while. We were of course all saddened uh, at the passing of Morris Wilkes last year at the age of 97, but it occurs to me that there might be people still alive who worked on EDZAC. Yes. They would be in their 70s and 80s now. Yes. Are, are there such people, and are you in contact with them? There are, there are two or three, and we're in touch with them. And, uh, and obviously, I mean, they're thrilled as well. And we're beginning to trawl their memories as well, and any <laughs> mementos that they kept. Yes. Because being engineers, everybody will keep notebooks and scrapbooks as well. Right. So there are a limited number of people, but there are people there. Uh, one of the things you might want to do is do videotaped oral histories of them to get their stories yes. and uh, be able no. to preserve. Absolutely. Uh, Luckily, just, well, not even a year before Sir Morris died, the British Library went through an exercise to do a complete oral history with, with Sir Morris as well. So we have that, and that, that was just, just fortuitous. There were several questions here, and I had one as well about reliability. What, what, what do you know about the reliability of EDZAC when it ran? And what is your prediction of the reliability of the machine that you're building? I think, as I said, EDSAC was built quite conservatively because it was, it was not meant to be any leading edge technology. This was meant to be a service. So components were over specified. Everything worked well with intolerances. So we expect the machine to be reliable. Uh, as an equivalent um, machine in terms of just the sheer number of valves is the Colossus computer. Colossus has got, I think, nearly 5,000 valves, no, 3,000 valves on it. We expect in Colossus to replace one valve every year. But we are very, very, it's demonstrated every day, but we are very careful. It certainly isn't just switched on. It takes something like five minutes for the heater voltages to come up and the HT voltages to come up. But one valve a year out of about 3,000 valves is pretty good going. One valve a year is amazing, but yeah. uh, as, as we know from Sage, which had 51,000 valves, it's possible to build reliable, reliable computers yeah. out, of, oh, out of valves. Yeah. One tends to think of them as, uh, as unreliable. Um, I was fascinated by the notion of one of your restorations where the, mach uh, the machine was lost in storage. Mm. Uh, we have the conception of a museum like the London Science Museum as one of such organization that having objects that size being lost would be impossible. Um, How can that happen? Well, I think museums never actually lose anything. They just simply can't find it. <laughs> um, and in fairness, this wasn't the London Science Museum, it was in Birmingham. And I think um, 
inventories and accessionless change. Um, Birmingham, for instance, had a whole group of volunteers in to actually build their, um, uh, their indexing system. And unless our engineers are looking at these components, they won't actually recognise what they are. So, for instance, the, the paper tape um, punches and readers for the hardware machine, when we discovered, when we physically found them and found the inventory tag, went back to the index, it was down as some sort of ticker tape machine. And that's a non-engineer looking at this machine and coming up with a description. So it just shows that you really need engineers to actually quantify and describe accurately what those spurs are. And in fairness to them, of course, we did actually eventually find everything. So they didn't lose anything. How, how hard, I'm, I'm uh, astonished at the number of machines that CCS has restored or, or created anew. How hard is it to find the volunteers, the engineers, to keep them running, and do they all? Are they all running? I mean, if it, it, is the Pegasus operated on a daily basis? Is the uh, 803 continuously operating? Pegasus, until a year or so ago, was uh, was operated on uh, certainly every week, and, and there were scheduled demonstrations of the Pegasus computer. Uh, we had a problem with Pegasus, a small fire in part of the, in fact, in part of the marginal checking circuits which has put a sort of moratorium on displays, but we expect within a few months to that to be back on display. Um, finding volunteers and enthusiasts isn't a problem. Finding people with particular skills is an increasing problem. Um, the Pegasus guys that look after the machine would welcome new volunteers. Anyone with plenty of time during the week and a thorough 40 year history of high voltage electronics and valve technologies could certainly apply. <laughs> so, um, so training new people is, is becoming very, very much more important to us. Let's talk a bit about the, the purpose for doing this. Uh, Gordon Bell, who was one of the founders of this museum, every once in a while challenges us saying, I'm no longer interested in atoms, I'm only interested in bits. Couldn't we learn as much by writing a software emulator of the EDZAC as we could by constructing the machine out of atoms? I I don't believe so. We, um, I think we, we, we know that we're restoring machines. It, things like the 2966, huge mainframe. We know that certainly in 100 years' time, that won't be running for, what, for whatever reason. It's important there isn't an emulator for the 2966. There's not a complete description of the order code. It's important to get that machine working so we can encapsulate that. We can develop an emulator and prove it against the machine. It is always very difficult. The only emulator we have at the moment for uh, EDSAC um, isn't emulating sort of gate level changes, it's just emulating the order code. Now, is it absolutely correct? It seems to run the test programs properly, but it's the, it's the exceptions and the error handling that's always very, very tricky to actually test on an emulator because you're checking, you're tweaking the emulator until it runs that code. But what happens on a divide by zero or a jump to a non-existent address? It's always that sort of exception handling that's very difficult to, to prove. Now, a, a computer, even a, a functional replica of a computer, computer is a mute object unless you have software for it. Hmm. How much original EDZAC software survives? Really, a, a huge amount. Um, the original test programs are, um, uh, are all intact. Um, some of the projects, some of the programs that we used for the research teams that led to Nobel Prizes is still available as well. So with EDSAC, we, we are particularly lucky. For the Harwell machine, um, because of its use in post-war atomic energy and production of weapons, all of that software has been lost. Um, so that, that is more of a, of a problem. That one. Maybe what you ought to do is uh, commission the c construction of new software, uh, run a contest for schools yes. for yes. the best or most creative new EDSAC software. Yes, absolutely. Mm. There's nothing like presenting a machine to school children or university, ch uh, university students and waiting for them to say, where's the compiler? <laughs> and they say, aha, there's no compiler, there's not even an assembler. Yes. 
you should say, wouldn't you like to write one? <laughs> yes, yes, yes. And you've got two k to do it. Yeah. Yes, right. Uh, you described the funding of the EDZAC replica project by Herman Hauser and friends. Uh, the question here is, who funded the original EDZAC? Well, the, the university itself. Um, Sir Maurice was given an amazing freedom, almost with carte blanche, to just do uh, exactly as he, as, he expe as he wanted to do. He'd been in the US at the Moore School lectures and traveled back to the UK um, by boat, obviously, and sketched out exactly the design he wanted to build for EDSAC on that boat journey back. And there were no committees to have to go to, no budgets or proposals, and just got on with it, with the university paying. I, I suspect that probably wouldn't happen today. To what extent was there or is there a competition between Manchester and Cambridge for the production of these machines? Um, Yes, yes, there is, there is, there is, there is competition. I mean, when you talk about the first stored program machine, or the first practical stored program machine, the nice thing about computing and first is there are so many of them, <laughs> and as long as you qualify it enough, then you're not going to offend anybody. But yes, if we had a team here from Manchester, it might be a completely different story. Uh, there's a question here which I think I know the answer to, which is, was EDZAC patented, and if not, why not? No. No, it was, it was um, actually my colleague might mention this later on, it, it, the university didn't patent anything at that stage. Um, the circuits were free and made available to everybody. Uh, there's a question here which generally has to do with the complicated multiple organizations that are involved in this project. Mm. I know the CCS and the museum and yep. Fletchley Park and the National Museum of Computing and so forth. How much how free are you to do what you think is right in this project, or are you going to be closely supervised by multiple bureaucracies? Uh, the CCS has quite a history uh, with it, these three uh, museums, but we work closely with the museums as well, working with the curators and the conservators. Um, so for instance, a team that's working on um, a machine at the London Science Museum will have to go through the volunteer training scheme for the Science Museum and work according to their rules, That's you know, particularly working safely. Um, and we're working with those organisations, all three museums, to try and come up with a sort of a consistent set and a consistent training scheme. Now all the museums actually work very closely together, so there isn't particularly competition between the three museums, so that's really beginning to work quite well. I have a question about um, the restorations, not the buildings of replicas, and it's an issue which we confront when we do similar activities, which is the, and you mentioned it briefly, the tension between the conservators and the engineers and mm -hmm. the preservation of an original artifact and the modification of it to make it into an operating machine. Mm -hmm. Can you talk more about what you permit yourselves to do, what you don't, how you identify the things that you're changing for the purpose of restoration? Well, yeah, absolutely. Accurate, accurate record keeping um, is vital. And, and even if a component has changed, if a component's changed, there are accurate records of exactly what was changed, why it was changed. All of, any components that are removed are obviously all kept as well. That's absolutely vital. Um, the intention is to replace as little as possible. One problem we had with the Ferranti Pegasus is the fuse holders included um, an asbestos sleeve. Now that had to be replaced as well. But they will be actually kept and kept sealed and safely. Um, and we try and do it as absolutely as little as possible and document everything. But, but you're, you're quite right, it, it, it is a tension. Um, uh, and a discussion and a dialogue that carries on continuously. Th there is no, let's agree, this is what we can do. Because people change and opinions change and fashions change. So we're constantly having that dialogue. Right. Uh, as are we as well, and yeah. it's, uh, it's, a, it's a difficult problem. As, I assume as part of the EDZAC uh, construction project, you will be reproducing new schematics, new timing diagrams, and, and new documentation. Mm. 
in order to leave a trail behind yeah. for, for future generations. It seems to me training the next generation of restorers and maintainers yep. of this machine has to be the, one of your highest priorities. Yeah, yeah abs absolutely. We, have, we haven't made it available yet, but we have a, um, a core of information that we've discovered about the machine, and that will be made available very shortly for everybody. Um, and as we, as we um, redraw circuit diagrams and things like the CAD um, diagrams for the chassis, we'll make those generally available. Well, thank you very much. Uh, we've all enjoyed this uh, presentation, and if there are no other questions... Uh, thank you, Len. Thank you.